Okay, so thank you. It's great to be here. Um, my thanks to Lumen and Legit and uh, thanks to Computer Art Society. My thanks to the judges or possibly a judge who shortlisted my image. God, can you hear me? Do I need to get a bit closer? My image being this. Yeah. Okay, it was kind of slightly tricky, but okay. Okay, how's that? All right. Okay. Hmm. So. So I've um, so this is more of, uh, in the nature of reminiscences rather than going into very great technical detail. Uh, reminiscences, a bit of a tutorial, and then some of my more more recent work. Um, so I've called it then and now my computer graphics then and now, and the then refers to back in the 70s when I went to Cardiff University to do an electronic music course, and. Obviously, as a student, one gets access to various to, all, to various bits of equipment, and some of the equipment we give, were given access to was the, the mainframe computer, as they were at the time, and plotters and other devices. But I was only aware of the computer and the plotter, really, and I, and I thought there was some aesthetic potential in, in this. Um, so that's a, the kind of plotter we would use. Uh, we used so it's basically a, a ballpoint pen moving on a rail horizontally and paper moving vertically on spro you know, sprocketed paper moving vertically and between and, and you can ask the pen to lift and descend ask, uh, to move from coordinates to coordinates and so on so and this is a bit of the uh, the the um, workstation the hardware this, that's actually not the computer that is just a monitor and a keyboard so I decided to explore the potential of this stuff I learnt Fortran um, which is a, a contraction of formula translation, translation. And this is back in the mid 70s. And this is before the bitmap file had been formulated on, and J, JPEG and so on. So I, w I had the only, uh, the only devices I had access to were, as I say, the CalComp plotter. Um, so that's a bit of Fortran. You see, I defined pi in the middle there. Fortran isn't a very graphics friendly program, but I, it was interesting learning. and. There's a little snippet of that of the uh, output from that program on the right. There, it's a kind of radiating, um, squiggly figure, essentially. One could describe it. Uh, that's and this is another, uh, again, pen on paper work that I wrote, that I that I created back back then, um, and that's a, yeah, that's a flyer for a computer graphics exhibition that I uh, kind of hosted. Back in 1980, that's one, one of my works, rather more chaotic than I tend to make nowadays. Um, and when I was doing this, I, I came across the existence of the Computer Art Society, which was run by the, at the time, founded by John Lansdowne, this uh, chap, um, back in 1969, 68, I think it was. And he was keen to use computers in his, he was, a, he was an architect, he, he was keen to use computers in his architectural practice and also to explore the artistic, aesthetic potential. And so I found myself going down on a f late on a Friday by train to London uh, every month when they had the meetings. And so we'd gather in his architect's office and, and kick around what we've, been, what we've been doing for the last month. And he was, he was a really nice character, very kind of impish and mischievous and energetic and uh, uh, supportive, a very, lo very lovely chap. And I remember one, on one occasion he spoke about having been approached by the makers of um, the producers of the film Superman, because they wanted to do a kind of morph between a kind of crystal face and the face of Superman's father, or possibly vice versa, or possibly Superman himself. Um, and he had, he, they thought he had the kind of technology to do, to do that kind of thing. This is way back in the early 70s, if you remember. Um, and I also understand that he, his company was responsible for the, the opening credits in, in Alien, that is the film Alien, that is to say where the spaceship is is kind of drifting through space, and the p consoles gradually come to come to life one by one, to mm. notify the, the the crew that there's a life form nearby or a planet nearby. I forget the details. Okay, so um, that's what I was doing then. Using that was the then, using Fortran, driving a Calcomp Cal plotter, a ballpoint on paper basically, and I kind of forgot about. It. I, I lost touch with that at the time. There were no such things as um, you know personal computers and so on, but then in 2003 I went along to the uh, Bridget Riley retrospective 
in Tate Britain. And I was very Im impressed by this and looking at, the, looking at her work and also by Vasarelli, I, I thought it's time to dust off the kind of things I'd been, I'd been doing before and just explore further. So that's what I started to do, only this time I was using Pascal, again, not a very graphics friendly program. I think this is a bit of program that writes a bitmap file. It writes a couple of headers there, and then it goes through the data and um, writes out all the, all the data points. And the thing about, the thing about this is that now, you know, by now we had all these very nice file formats. Rather than controlling a pen on a bit of paper, one now had a grid of points, and each point had a red, green, and blue value and so one had a fantastic um, a potential using geometry and, and and understanding of color to produce you know very very more elaborate forms i was still doing it in uh, from i i wasn't right i wasn't using any software packages that were d d d designed for graphics i was doing it all um, using writing my own you know primitive functions and so on so so that's uh, one of the things i was doing fairly early on um, very different style. Okay, so so I started to explore various different families of, you know, ways of ways of using form and color and so on. So this is from a subdivision series where I was just div dis dis dividing up recursively, as it happens, is it, it uses recursive code actually, um, to divide up the, the square, a plane. Uh, that's another one, uh, possibly a more familiar um, kind of shape. Uh, it's the golden mean, of course. Okay, so that's uh, this is from another family, my Mandala series, and this is another one from the same my Mandala series. So that's fairly. S yeah, it's not wonderfully three-dimensional moving stuff, but I was it was the thing I wanted to explore, uh, and this is another one from another family, Fibonacci, and what I wanted to do. Oh, can I? I'm just going to move this. Oh move this so I can read the screen. Oh, this is like all slightly tricky. Um, oh, if I do that. Oh, oh no. <laughs> okay. Oh, darn it. Sorry. Sorry, people. Oh, dear. Okay. All right. Oh, no, 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 no. no. I'm so sorry. What is it that one? Okay. All right, I'll, won't, I, I'll only move a finger. <laughs> Okay, so uh, this is another exa example, example or rather, m member of a family, of, of one of these families, the um, Fibonacci um, I series of images. And so a lot of people will recognize this as Fibonacci related in some way, but not know exactly how. So this is where my little mini tutorial comes in. So because I want to explain the connection, the draw a line between Fibonacci and this kind of image, and I hope that's okay for you. So. Fibonacci, Fibonacci the man, he was uh, actually, in fact, Leonard, Leonardo of Pisa, a mathematician, accountant. Um, the s he was the son of a chap called Boccaccio, which is, which is, and he was described, he was known as, he was someone in the 19th century who was following up his work, decided he sh he, a good name for him would be the son of Boccaccio, Filius Boccaccio, which was sh contracted to Fibonacci, you see. That's where the name comes from. The slide, the, the picture on the r on the left is Pisa, where he came from. I think it's a gorgeous image, so I wanted to include it. So, so the Fib Fibonacci is w was well was has been a tr <laughs> Fibonacci was is universally thought of as having introduced the numerals zero through nine into the West, into the mainstream of the West from Arabic and Hindu uh, origins. Which makes him a very, you know, significant figure in mathematics. But he's probably best, much better known for um, the Fibonacci series. So that was Fibonacci the man. This is Fibonacci the series, and the the the, the Fibonacci series is such that each member is the sum of the two previous members. So if you so if you're looking at the top the top line after the words Fibonacci series, you have one plus one gives two. And one and two is three, and two and three is five, and three and five is eight, and five and eight is thirteen, and so on. Eight and thirteen is twenty-one. So they're all members of the Fibonacci series. And the interesting thing about about this series is that the further along you get with the series, the more 
the last number is a ratio to the last but one number, the current number compared to the previous number, tends towards a particular value, 1.618033 and so on. Um, and that has interesting properties itself. That is known as the golden ratio or the golden section or the golden mean. And a rectangle with sides in that ratio of 1 to 1.618, as pictured here, has this curious property. If you add a square on the longer side, it'll produce another larger rectangle with its side in that same ratio, which it's the kind of thing that fascinates mathematicians. So what we'll do is we'll just I'll demonstrate that. So I'll take that that rectangle, which is in that ratio, 1 to 1.618, and I'll shrink it to the top right-hand corner. So that now we have a golden rectangle in the corner. If we add a square on the longer side, there it is. Add a square on the longer side of the new <coughs> rectangle, there it is. And and so on, each, uh, each addition forms a new rectangle which has the same ratio of the short side to the long side. And you can do the, uh, do obviously you can, one can do the reverse, one can subtract the square on the short side because we're going in that direction and, and so on and you end up with a similar thing. So, so that's part one of the, the line between Fibonacci and the, those Fibonacci figures. So what's the connection between that and the, the spirally figures that we're, we're looking at. Um, well, if you take the that ratio of 1 to 1.618, etc., and you kind of wrap that around a circle, so your circle then, your circumference of your circle is in, that ra in, that in the same ratio of 1 to 1.6, that's green, the green and the red are in the ratio of 1 to 1.6, then the angle produced, subtended, uh, angle at the center, produced by that green sector, that is the known as the golden angle. So it has the same, so you're preserving, you're, you're taking that ratio from the rectangle into the kind of circular area. So so now we've, we're in a position to start constructing those spiral patterns using the golden rectangle, which, as I say, is related to the, uh, sorry, using the golden angle, which, as I say, is related to the golden rectangle, which itself is derived from, can be derived from the Fibonacci series. Hence, hence the connection to Fibonacci. So we'll start with a blank canvas, and there it is. And then we'll put a little a, a central point I onto it, because these figures are really constructed from the center. What we'll do now is move up a, 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 a certain distance, place an element there, move round by the golden angle. So that's what we're doing, going an anti-clockwise by the golden angle, adding an element. We, 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 the, the distance from the center is increased a little. And then we do the same again, go, go further anti-clockwise by the same angle, golden angle, add an element, and so on. That's the fourth, that's the fifth, that's the sixth, whoops, sixth and the seventh. And there's no obvious spiral pattern, so let's take a, take a bit of a leap. So now we've got up to 34 elements, um, and up to 55 elements. And some, some a sense of those spirals starts to, to emerge. So let's con let's see how what the connection is. So there we have two spirals that are implicit in that pattern, um, shown you know fairly clearly. There's, there's, a, there's an anti-clockwise set and a clockwise set of spirals indicated, and so we've gone up to 144 elements. And these numbers, by the way, they're all Fibonacci numbers: 44, 55, and so on. Um, Okay, so it may seem rather arbitrary to add the golden angle as we're constructing these patterns, but it does seem that nature has actually got there first. So these the flowers typically, not invariably, but typically have a Fibonacci number of, of petals and of seeds, and the flowers and the seeds are typically arranged in this Fibonacci image kind of way, so the spirals are, are clear. So here is a chamomile flower. There are two obvious spirals that have been marked, not by me, I, I pinched this from the net, in fact. Um, two obvious spirals, 13 in one direction and 21 in the other. And again, there, that's a, those are both Fibonacci numbers. So if we used, but if we used another angle other than the golden angle, we, we, we get a, some kind of different arrangement. Here we've used exactly a fifth of the complete circle to advance each time. 
and obviously it's not a very good arrangement for packing. So I, I, one thing I should have said here is that each, each element, each flower, as you can see, has, it occupies more or less the same, pretty much the same area, the same space, which is very helpful ev evolutionarily from the point of view of material and, and, as I say, packing of seeds um, compared to that, which is obviously pretty hopeless because you have great big spaces and, and seeds would be piled on each other uh, in, those, um, in the limbs. Fibonacci patterns occur a lot in nature. So here's a pine cone, and you can see the spirals very clearly. And this is another spiral. I just wanted to make the point that it, it, the, the development does seem to relate to the golden angle. So if you, if you, if you can see the number one there in, in the towards the center, that's the first one, that's the smallest. The next one generated or probably uh, these are th 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 that's the most recent one generated because they're, they're spreading out from from the end but essentially you've got number one then number two number three that's not exactly the golden angle it's slightly larger but then you go over to number four that's pretty much the golden angle over to five slightly larger six the golden angle seven the golden angle and so on so I would suggest I suggest that uh, maintain that there is that this golden angle really is embedded in in nature in, a, in this f profound way uh, it may be something to do with growth. You have you have cells and they and they add, um, then uh, you get subsequent cells and and if they add in in this Fibonacci way, then you'll get then you may end up with this pattern in some way. So this is another okay yeah another uh, example of the um, spirals. Um, so if you're when I first came across this stuff, uh, people said that if you have a seed head with 89 seeds, you'll have 13 spirals clockwise and 21 anti-clockwise. And as whereas a seed head with 144 seeds, which a larger one, would have 21 spirals anti-clockwise and 34 clockwise. And I, th I thought, well, I when you go from the smaller one to the larger one, you're simply adding around the edge, you're not changing it. So the spirals must all be, all the spirals mentioned must still be present. So, so and in fact they are, it's just that when they're at certain angles, um, they are more or less visible. So here I've, I've marked, I've picked out um, the ones closer to the center, ones further away, and they're, they're all present. So here's uh, another example. You can see nearer the center, um, there are 987 elements, 21 spirals, very clearly spiral towards the center, but as the further out you get, the uh, the the more th closer to parallel to the edge the lines are so it's less and less clear that they're part of a spiral but you, you lose the sense of the spiral when you get further from the center um this is a detail again with 987 elements but with five complete su spirals picked out and the interesting thing is that these spirals go right back to the center e every single element has a spiral have all these spirals going through it um, and it, it some of them are clearer than others because of, of where they are Okay, um, this is uh, something about the Fibonacci. I, I, I'm very fascinated by all this stuff. Um, it's, it's kind of interesting to see where, the, where these transitions occur, and this is an, an image I produced just to kind of play on that kind of ambiguity. So you have black and white dots on, on the gray background. Okay, so you know, parenthetically, I, I said we've one uses the golden angle to create these patterns, but one can divide up the complete circle into other patterns, into other ratios. Like here I've used a square root of two to divide that whole circle into two parts. And you, get, you do get a superficially similar pattern. You can, you've got the same kind of spirals, but, and I've not really explored that thoroughly yet. So, so once we have that kind of generative principle, there are various things we can do with that kind of principle, that structure. Um, you can have a large number of elements. Um, one can change the size, alter the size of the elements systematically. One could alter the degree of overlap of the elements and systematically do color changes with the elements. Um, here I've connected consecutive elements. So in fact, that, that if, you, if you look at a point and see where the line goes, it's, it's heading towards an element which is the golden angle away from it. And you can use other shapes and other than circular as the elements. Uh, you can connect the center of the image to the elements, in this case by lines which are phased, colored from pink to blue. Uh, same kind of thing, but here the center is connected to the elements, okay, with, um, with cones. 
Uh, th here we have a kind of a reticulation of elements and spirals. And the same kind of thing again, lines to the cent from the center to the elements, um, and the ret reticulations in white. The same kind of thing again, or similar thing again. You can connect the, fill the spiral, fill the spirals with gradations of color. Uh, there and there, you can change systematically change the angle so it's not the golden angle all the way through. That's what I've done here. I've used Photoshop to do various other things here. Uh, um, we can have overlapping and interlocking elements as as here, or we can add we can have perspective that would bring us back to that. So that's my that's my computer assisted art then and now. Thank you.